just want to uh, go over a few things that we've been sharing recently about uh, tradition and and uh, where, we're, where we're at as far as obedience is concerned. It's got a lot to do with, I believe, the way we live. Paul obviously saw it as a major problem that was in his life, trying to break the power of tradition, wrong thinking, wrong teaching, wrong things that have gone on in our lives. And to break those things, sometimes it's not very, very easy. And so Paul, in his writings to the different churches and the epistles, spoke a lot about uh, trying to break free. And I wouldn't be surprised if today in our life that there's a lot of things that we need to be set free from. We need to have something broken over our lives. It doesn't mean that it's, that it's uh, you know, demonic or some major thing, but it's something there that in our thinking stops us from going to the next level, so, stops us from being able to activate our faith the way God wants to activate it, it stops us from going to where God wants us to go. And so we've said a lot of things there, but in Mark chapter 7, 13, uh, the Lord speaks there and it says that we make the word of no effect because of our tradition, because of, of the way we believe, the way we've handed things down. Things are handed down, wrong thinking. Somebody that might have had a bad experience, somebody that's, that's been affected by somebody might tell you don't trust anybody. Don't trust anybody anymore. Don't, don't trust they'll rip you off. This affects us in, in our relationships, in our business or in our marriage. These sort of things affect us if we can't learn to trust. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in every way acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. So there's things there that, that have been handed down to us. It may, you may not even be aware of these things from time to time. We, we may not understand it, but it has an effect on our lives. And I believe that this is what God wants to set us free from. Saul, who became Paul, obviously was a man that was built and had so much in his mind and in his imagination about the things of God but when the Holy Spirit started to move and Jesus came on the planet, he, ha he could not understand it, he could not see it, he could not receive it because of the teaching that he had. And Paul said this about himself in Philippians 3.5. He, he said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, are persecuting the church concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So this was his pedigree. This is who he was. He was all these things. And, and this thing had such an effect on him that when God began to move on the planet, he could not see it. And yet deep in his heart and in, in everything on the inside of him would have wanted to please God. Everything on the inside of him wanted, would, would have wanted to see the Messiah. And now here's the Messiah walking through the planet and, and he doesn't see him. You see, he needed to have an encounter with God that would change his theology, that would change the way he thought. And I believe that every Christian, friend, it's not enough just to come into church and perhaps sing a couple of hymns and listen to a, a, a message or something like that and, and, and applaud and say this and say that. But friend, every one of us needs an encounter with God, something there that will touch our heart. And sometimes throughout our Christian life, it's not just a one touch. Yes, one touch, you get born again. But as we go through life, God continues to touch us. Just like Greg, he's been saved a long time. But it wasn't that long ago that through circumstances, through situation, through prayer and through ministry, that somehow or other God got through that thing that, was, that, that holds us down. And then all of a sudden, he, he gets a glimpse. He has an encounter with God that opens up something to, to the heavens. And now he just thinks about Father God and he sees something there 
that, that changes his heart and his attitude and everything like that melts something. Friend, every one of us needs an encounter with God. Don't just, and, and an encounter with God comes, friend, from obedience, from responding. Too often in our lives, we, we, we can be so proud and so, I, I don't know what, but just get it. I've got everything, I've got all my ducks in a row, I'm okay. We can even say, well, I'm on my way to heaven. But I want to tell you, God wants to do something dynamic in your life that will change things and break strongholds and release things from our lives. And I would imagine if, if Jesus tarries uh, for another 100 years or whatever it might be, and I live to be 90 or 100 or whatever it might be, that it, I pray that in my walk with Him, He continues to touch me. He continues to draw me. He continues to reveal things in my life that I might be more of Him and less of me. Amen? It comes from responding to God. It comes from, from allowing your heart as, as the Spirit of God touches you as the anointing touches you to, to allow God to have access into your heart so that you can respond. I want to tell you, friends, everything starts with a response. You can say no, even when the Holy Ghost is moving in a mighty way. You can say no. I would imagine many of us have done that. I have. But this, I praise God for the times I said yes. I praise God for those times. And Paul, this man, was on his road, on a way to, to persecute the church, thinking that he was helping God, thinking he was doing the right thing. But we know there that as he was on his way, and friend, every one of us are on our way, that God intervened. And I pray today, and I don't know if that's your prayer, but Father God, today I pray that you will intervene in our lives. You will not let us just continue down a road, my God, that's perhaps not leading anywhere. But my God, that you'll take us into your very purpose, into your very plan that you have for our lives. Break every stronghold, pull everything down that needs to be pulled down. And for that, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, Amen. because friend, God wants to use the church in this hour. And Paul was on the road to Damascus. And it says that a great light shone around him. And as that light shone around him, something happened. He fell on the ground. He fell to his, to his, on his face. And I remember as a young Christian going to a meeting, and the, as the man was preaching there, and as he, was, as he was just moving in the Spirit, and as he started to make an altar call, friend, I want to tell you, altar calls are one of the most dynamic things in a church. It's where you can meet with God. It's where you can say, yes, I need you to touch me. It's where you can say, God, I'm going to respond to what you want. And you start to take that step. And I remember as I started to walk out to that altar that day, I can't remember what the man was praying for or what, he was, what the appeal was about. All I know is that it touched something in my heart and I came out to the front with a, with a heart that wanted God. And as I stood there with my hands open, uh, with my heart open rather, just stand there, and as this man began to pray for me, the Spirit of God just came over my life. And for the first time in my life, I fell under the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe Saul, that became Paul, fell under the power of the Holy Ghost. And I don't know, I've heard a lot of preachers say, it's like you go onto God's operating table, and he starts doing this and he starts doing that. I don't know any of those things. All I know is that as I fell under the power, as I laid on the floor, I had an encounter with an almighty God who touched my life. And I want to tell you, I remember as I got off the floor, I did not want to talk to anybody. I didn't want, I just w crawled underneath a, a potted plant and I just sat there as I allowed the anointing of God to touch me. Friend, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's the anointing of God that you and I need. And this man saw, this man saw had an encounter with God. And as, 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 as this thing that was going on in his life, God began to speak to him. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Friend, I, I, we've got to realize that when people come against you, they're not coming against you naturally, they're coming against him. And if you get a revelation of this and understand this, and then you get that song, God is fighting for me, pushing back the strongholds. Lord, you, these people are not coming against me, they're coming against you. 
they're coming against you. And my God, if they're coming against you, greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. And Lord, I, I'm just believing and I come into that identification with you today and we're going to push back the stronghold because I'm going to put my trust in you. Don't put your trust in anything else but him. And Saul, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he said, Saul, it's hard to kick against the pricks. It's hard to go against the flow. It's hard to go against what God wants to do in your life, friends. But you can fight him if you want to, or you can yield to him. Usually when we, have to, when we yield to God, we have to surrender our pride. I know so many people that because they've been in ministry or because they've done this or done that, they can't actually respond publicly. Friend, I want to tell you, we've got to be transparent before God. Amen? I don't know about you, but I need an encounter with God. I need to meet with God. Amen? I, I need to draw everything I can as we're worshiping, as we're singing those, those songs. As, 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 as Jody sings that song, I shall live and not die. I, I, I glean from that, amen. As Greg, as he wrote that song, as the other psalmists, as, as those people wrote those songs, every song has got a story, amen. And oh, friend, you know, we've got to just be able to get involved with those songs. I, I get shakabundi. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about? I'm not just singing a song. I'm not just singing a hymn. I'm not just singing lullabies. We're, 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 we're creating an atmosphere that we can come under the Shekinah glory, come under the presence of God. We'll be amazed what's happening. We can be amazed at... at, at, at Feet that are being healed. I believe that, that we could see creative miracles in Jesus' name. I believe that when, the, when those feet come out, the toes will be painted. Glory to God. I don't know what color you like. Little pinkies floating around in there. Amen. You might think I'm stupid. I most surely am. But I'd rather be stupid for Jesus and believe for a miracle than not. I'd rather put my trust in Him. Paul was so caught up in tradition, it stopped him from seeing the Messiah he was looking for. But Paul's encounter changed his theology. God is always working on our behalf and for our best interest. If only we can just open up our hearts, open up our hearts. Most moves of the Spirit are to stop by man. They say, don't talk about the blood. Friend, we've got to talk about the blood. Peter and Cornelius, a mighty move of God. God starts to speak to Peter and starts to speak to Cornelius because God wanted to do something. I, I honestly believe that God is always speaking. He's always bringing revelation. He's always sharing. He's always wanting to touch. He's always, he's always drawing. He's always pulling. You know why? Because that's who God is. God's not like you and I that just gets turned on every now and then if we sing a hymn. God is always turned on. Amen. He never sleeps or He never slumbers. He's always wanting to touch His people. He's always looking, searching, wanting. Who will open up their heart today? Who can I touch today? Who can I meet today? Who can I help today? But friend, many times we the church, we do not accept it. God is always moving. He's always speaking. He's always looking. And of course, when God starts to speak and he starts to share with Peter, Peter, do this and do that. Peter says, no, no, I've never done this. I never will do this. And so tradition stops us. Tradition and the way we believe stop us. In Galatians chapter 2, I'd like for you to just open up your Bibles there. Amazing story here. This is Paul. Peter, the great apostle. Peter, the man whose shadow touched people and they were healed. 
Peter, the man who, who met with Jesus in a prison, and, and, and the angel of the Lord just spoke to him and touched him and said, rise. And as he rose, all the, the chains and the, and the things there, the natural things that were holding him, fell off. As he walked to the prison door, the, the, the prison door opened up. As he went to the main gate, uh, the, 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 the ones there that were guarding were asleep and they walked straight through. As they came to the main gate, it opened up and they walked out free people. Mighty, miraculous power of God. But friend, I want to tell you, even after we're touched by God, even after we've been ministered to by the Spirit, even though we've had some of these encounters, there's still things in our, in our thinking, in our tradition that stop us. And here's a, this is, Saul wrote, Paul wrote these words, and, and, and it, it's a, it, they're strong words. I've lost my spot again here. <laughs> Just hang on. And there's strong words. Chapter 2, verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. Paul comes to, in front of Peter, and he had to confront him face to face because he was to be blamed. Before, before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the, of, of the circumcision or the Jewish Christians. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that Barnabas was carried away by the hypocrisy. It goes on and it talks about, and Paul goes on and talks about being saved by faith. And what was happening here, Peter was going backwards and forwards, in and out, up and down. When he was with the Gentiles, he acted like a Gentile. And when the Jews came, he turned around, he acted like a Jew. He, didn't, he, he feared the Jewish Christians. And so he was then putting pressure on the Gentiles and, and things. And, and Paul said, hey, he said, you being a Jew, you act like a Jew. Why, why then do you want the Gentiles to become Jews? Why? What's going on here, Peter? And he had to challenge him. He had to rebuke him. And he had to stop him from going on. I believe there that Peter was going back because of his tradition, back into bondage that, that Jesus had set him free from. Peter left the freedom of his salvation and he returned to the law which Christ had redeemed him from. He returned to the bondage because he feared the Jewish Christians. You, you'll, you'll read a lot of things here in this book, but I praise God that here, because God loves us and because God understands us, that he just didn't say to Peter, okay, Peter, this is what's happening to you now. I'm going to reject you. I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of you. you know, I'm going to cut you off. No, what happens is confrontation comes in the realm of the Spirit. And Peter has, has confrontation with, with Paul. And Paul says, why are you doing this? And then he goes on, oh, foolish Galatians, who, who, who? What's going on that you started in the Spirit? Now you're going back into the flesh. I praise God today that God wants to come again he, because He understands us and He knows our hearts. And I pray, praise God that out of that encounter, Peter changed and Peter got free from that bondage that he was going back into. There's other stories here that, that boggle my mind at times. Logic and, and what seems right to our senses is another area that we find. I believe that logic is what really just seems right to us. I know a lot of people there that, that try to work out what's best for your life. This is best if I do this, if I do that. And we make decisions on logic and not by the Spirit. And as people, I've heard many people come to me after and say to me, Neil, I am so sorry that I made that decision. I'm so sorry that I did that. I'm so sorry that I went that way. Because it wasn't the way of the God. See, logic just does things that seem right to our senses. But the reality, having reality, is your heart being open to God. And another thing is, is your heart right with God? 
God looks at our hearts. He knows and sees everything. I want you to have a look with me at a very interesting story that's found in the book of Samuel. 1, uh, 1 Samuel. Very, very interesting scriptures here. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is death. The most important thing today for you and me is to be able to stand before a holy God. Even though we've made mistakes, you might have kicked the cat on the way through this morning. You might have got mad with somebody that, that cut in front of you. You might have done a lot of things. But today that we can stand before a holy God with hearts wide open, allowing Him to, to filter through, to cleanse us, to help us, to have a heart open to God. There's a way that seem a right, seems right to a man, but at the end thereof is death. We can do a lot of things that seem right, but if my heart's not right, I'm not right. If I've still got anger and bitterness and stuff like that in my heart, I'm in trouble. If I carry grudges, if I, if I do this and I do that, certain things, I'm in trouble. And this is the situation here. It says in verse 1, Now the, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped in Apec. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And they joined a uh, battle. Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. A lot of times when we do things, you might hear something and but if your heart's not right, friend, you're in trouble. When things go wrong, this is what people say. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? I want to tell you this. God will never, ever, ever let you down. If we are defeated, it is not God's fault. This might sound a little bit hard, but friend, we've got to start looking at ourselves and checking our own hearts and making sure that we have got short accounts. Why has the Lord defeated us? Why doesn't God do this? Why, why, why? Friend, I want to tell you, God is for you. He is not against you. God wants you to win. He wants you to triumph. He wants you to be victorious. He wants you to rule and reign in this life. Why has the Lord defeated us before the Philistines? And then they said, let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. When he comes amongst us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. Friend, you can do all the religious things you want to do. You can religion, religious things will not help us. I had the privilege this morning of helping the people with their thing through the door there. The Catholics meet here before us. Mary was most probably in there. She's not helping them. Might have been a couple of others in there. They're not doing any good either. They just come out for Sunday morning for an hour, and then if the past, if the preacher goes on for a little bit too long, they're all cranky and they go on out. We went a bit long today, five minutes. 
Don't get cranky with me this morning. You can have all these things you can, you can do. Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant in. Let's do this. When he comes in, oh, he will save us from our enemies. No, friend, get your heart right with God. <laughs> oh, man, you're very quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning. It's not God, it's us, amen. If we bring the, the Ark of the Covenant in, he, he'll, he'll, he'll save us. God will save it. Yes, God can save by many or by few. But I want to tell you, we've got to have our lives right with Him. There's got to be something there that He wants to do there. And so it says here that they, that they brought the Ark of the Covenant in. Let me just get back to where I am. I think I'm in the wind's blowing me around here a bit today. And the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubims and the two sons of Eli, Hoppen and Panathos, whatever his name is, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. These two guys, these sons of, of, of this prophet, these guys were playing the idiot. These guys were laying with women in the, in the, in the, in the holy place. They had no respect. They had no, they were just, the sin was just, and God could not work because of the sin that was over the people. But let's bring the so they bring it, and these two guys come in, and, and, the, and the, they're there, and the Bible says here, so they sent there, blah, 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 and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, and all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Friend, this is, a, this is what the Bible says. Here's a situation here where these people, they're, they're, they're in trouble. They're being defeated. And so they said, let's bring the presence of God in. Let's, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant in. Let's do this. And when He comes, He's going to do that. Friend, we've got to really understand that it's more than that. There's this way that seemeth right. So they bring the ark in, and there goes a shout. There's the place, whole place is shaken. It says that the whole earth shook. It says there that, that the people heard the shout. They heard the sound. So the Philistines were afraid, and they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us, who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. And so here they are. They're, they're there. They're scared stiff because they know what God can do. But friend, what we've got to understand is we, I know what God can do, but I want to tell you, if He can get a bunch of people, if He can get a bunch of people on this planet, they will certainly surrender themselves and die to the flesh and die to their own ambition and die to their own ways and get right with God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. I want to tell you, God is looking for a people, a drawn out people, a people who will say, yes, Lord, a people who will turn their back on things there that, that are wrong, that will say yes and humble themselves and fall on their face before God. Then the mighty power of God will come in. These, these Philistine people knew what God could do. The children of Israel knew what God could do. But God's hands were tied. They started to cry out. We know the story only too well for time's sake. I'll just relate it a little bit. That, the, that they came and they started fighting with the Philistines and the Israelites. But Israel was defeated. Not only were they defeated, it says that 40,000 foot soldiers died that day. And the people ran to their tents and they ran to their holes and they cried out. But what happened there was that the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. They stole the presence of God. They took it to a place called Ashdod. And as they took it there, it happened to be that they worshipped a God by the name of Dagon. And Dagon was in his tent, sitting there with all his glory, as people would come in and worship him and bow before him and carry on and do all the pomp and ceremony. He was such a good, feeling so good about himself. But they go into battle. I want to tell you, friends, God has got a plan don't underestimate what God can do. And as they bring the, the Ark of the Covenant, they said, what are we going to do with it? They said, let's take it into Dagon's tent. 
And they took it into Dagon's tent and they sat it before Dagon. Oh, I tell you what, I can, I can almost, if I am allowed a little bit of preacher's license, I can imagine as those foot soldiers, as they begin to walk out of that place with their pomp and their ceremony, as they place that, that, that the Ark of the Covenant in front of Dagon, as, 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 they, as the flap of the tent was closed, I can almost see Dagon saying, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> I can almost, I, 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 I can feel the, 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 the tension as, 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 the, as here's Dagon standing right before the ark of God. And the presence of God just looking straight up into Dagon's eyes and says, Bow! <laughs> and down he came. They said the next morning they came in and, and they opened up the tent and here is Dagon on his face. They put him up again. I don't know what he was doing all night on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. I can see the Ark of the Covenant. Boom, boom, boom. Presence of God, the anointing of God. Boom, boom. Old Dagon there. And they sat him back up. I can imagine Dagon saying, Get me out of here. Don't put me back on that. Get me out of here. Friend, I want to tell you, when God pulls some strongholds down, don't you put him back on the spot. Don't you put him back up there. You just deal with that thing and get it dealt with once and for all. They put old Dagon back up there. This time God says, right, Dagon, down you go again. This time he came down and everything that was broken off him, all he had left was his torso. But then God started to play havoc, started to, to bring a turmoil and troubles on, amongst the Philistine people they began to die. People started to get boils. People started to get uh, tumors. People started to, to get rashes, all these things. There was plagues of rats everywhere. There was a mess. And after a period of time, after they lost so many hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many people died, but many, many people died. They said, let's get rid of this God. <laughs> what can we do with him? So they took him to the next town. What was the next town? I can't remember. You can have a look. This is a lovely story. Read this story. It's a story of victory. They, they take him to the next town, and all of a sudden, the men there start breaking out in tumors and, and boils and rats and goodness knows what. Everything's starting to break out. And people said, get rid of this. Get rid of it. I don't know how many towns they took him to, two or three towns. And they said, look, let's send him back. Let's get rid of him. Get rid of him. Friend, God on his own. In that story, did what the armies of Israel could not do. God is looking today for a church. Not a church, but the church. We are a small segment of the church. Right? We are only a small segment of a church, the church. He's looking for a people. And I believe, I believe that the anointing of God that comes over us of a Sunday morning is there to gather us, to draw us, to help us. And in that presence, in that worship, in that, in that anointing where we can lift up our hearts to God, where we can lift up our voices, where we, can, where we can just cry out to God, where God can start to come in a mighty way, where He can start to change us, deliver us, set us free, where He can allow His Word to get inside us, where we do, where we, where we come and we say, God, greater is He that's within me than He that's within the world. God, You're fighting for me. You're, you're fighting for me. It's, the battle's not mine. God is fighting for us. Amen. God will deliver you. God will set you free. God will do whatever He can. It, it, see, I've, I've got to realize I can't criticize. I, I, I've got to be careful. I've got to guard my mouth. I've got to guard the way I think and the way I do things. If I start criticizing Greg and start pulling Greg down and telling him things and goodness knows what else, I'm actually not just coming against Greg. I'm coming against God. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm not discerning the Lord's body. The Bible says, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. I want to tell you, friends, I believe that God, it's a time of shaking. You, you had a word, I believe, this morning, or yesterday, was it? 
in the prayer meeting. What did that? What was it again? Can you remember? I don't know if we. Yeah. No. Yeah, I think on the prayer meeting at the end of the prayer meeting there was two words which came. This is a word for the church for the next year. Um, I don't know what's happening, but the two words are: be firm with your feet in me, and the second thing that. Um, and be firm with the, the good news of the gospel in your heart. And the second most important thing was, seek my strength. You will need it. Yeah. Yeah. See, we're, we're living... How many people believe that Jesus is coming back? What's he coming back for? A, a, a bride coming back for a glorious church, a church without spot or wrinkle, a church that's that's been through the fire, a church that's... That's, that's allowed God to come into his heart, into their heart. I, I, I honestly believe that, that we're there. And if I can get the musicians to come, I think Jody's at the back there, grab her, please. Uh, and we're just going to sing that song again in a minute. God is fighting for us. Who can be against us? Amen. But I, I just want to just say this again, that Dagon, the children of Israel, all this stuff, God... God is fighting for us. God is on our side. God is there. Whatever battle you face, whatever war you're going through, let God come into your house. Let God deal with, with the traditions and the, and the wrong thinkings and the, and the disappointments and the sorrows and the grief and, and shame and goodness knows what else. See, the enemy comes to rob, to kill, and to destroy. But God said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I believe that God wants to do stuff. And, and, and here I see this story as, as the children of Israel, they, they said, you know, all we've got to do is do this and everything's going to be all right. They, they did what they thought was right. But you see, the, the two sons of, of Eli, they both died in that battle. The, the whole situation, the whole scenario, because Eli knew what his sons were doing and, and ignored it and didn't, didn't friend, there's responsibility that we, that we have to have as pastors, as, as elders, as, as people in the church, that we can't just go through life singing lullabies and, and thinking everything's going to be okay because if we're getting closer to the end and, and if we are getting closer, which I believe we are, then God is going to require much more from us. And He's going to ask us, and, and I do not believe for one second that He's not speaking to our hearts. God speaks to our hearts and He wants us to change some things. Eli, when he heard the news, fell off his stool and he broke his neck and died. When one of the wives of one of the men that died was about to give, give birth to a child, when she heard that Eli had died and she also heard that, that, that her husband was dead, she went into labor and gave, brought forth a child and, and, and she fell back and died. They called the child Ichabod, which means God has departed. Friend, I want to tell you this. The, the church, if it continues to go on the way it's going, if the way it is, they say that 70% of some denominations do not believe in the virgin birth, do not believe in the resurrection, do not believe that Jesus died on a cross, do not believe that he's coming back, do not believe that there's a heaven or a hell. There's so many percentage of Pentecostal churches today that do not even speak in tongues. Friend, I want to tell you there's so much that we've got to change. We've got to come back. We've got to let the Spirit of God get around our lives again. We've got to somehow or other hunger and go after righteousness. I would love to say that I am here perfect, pure, washed. I'm washed in the blood. That's all that cleanses me. But and underneath, I'm a wretched man. But I know that my Savior, my God, will deliver me. I know, I know, I know. And if there's something in my heart today that's reaching out to God, that says, God, I want you, I want you, I want you, I want you. I want to see you glorified. I want to see your, you lifted high in the church. The church has got to change. There's going to come a great shaking. There's going to come a great, I believe, a great, a great trial in the church today. Something's got to happen. Can I hear an amen? I believe. I believe that God is going to do it.
He went in there and he dropped Dagon. Started to fight amongst the enemy. Today, today I want you to see, I don't know if there's people here that are, that are being attacked. People here that feel like as if this is, you, God is fighting for you today. You gotta, you gotta see him. You, I, I cannot fight the devil on my own. God is fighting for me. How many times has he said, the battle's not yours, it's mine. Stand still and see the salvation of your God. Friend, today stand. When you've done all the stand, stand. We heard the word this morning, stand strong because you're going to need it. Be strong in your God. Believe that your God is fighting for you today. See him going out today and putting uh, tumors and turmoil and whatever it is, rats all over the place, fight, chasing out the enemy, pushing back the strongholds. See him driving those forces that have come against you and see yourself today set free. See yourself. God is fighting for you. Amen. God wants to get our attention. It's the anointing. It's the anointing. It's the anointing. It's the anointing. Let's stand to our feet this morning. God is fighting for us. He's carrying our burdens. Why do you want to carry it yourself? He's covering your shame. He has overcome. Yes, He has overcome. We will not be shaken. We will not be moved. Jesus, you are here. He's carrying your burden, friend. Don't carry it. You don't, you don't need necessarily to do what I did. When I came out the front and they laid hands on me and but for the first time in my life, as the power of God hit me and the anointing as I fell to the floor, just something dynamic happened. But friend, you may be able to do it in another way. I just don't know. I just found that responding to God really is the best way. Saying yes to Jesus is the only way. Allowing Him to help me. Saying, God, I need help. The night Nancy and I got born again, the man who led us to Jesus really didn't know what he was doing. They took us out. I don't even know if he was saved. We're the only two people, well, three of us got saved. We're the only three people that I've ever seen saved in that church when that was that night. We've never had an altar call before in that church. So I say, I don't know if the guy was saved. You could have just been a church goer that they sent out with us. And he was supposed to pray for us and he didn't know how to pray. And he asked me, he said, do you pray? Have you prayed? I said, yeah, I prayed for a fish. He said, well, pray now. I remember I shut my eyes as tight as I could. And even now I'm holding, got my fist so tight too. I, I feel the, what it was like because I, I was terrified. And there was just Nancy and I and this other lady and this guy unsaved, I think. <laughs> and I shut my eyes as tight as I could and I clenched my fist and I looked up to heaven. I said, God, help me. Amen. <laughs> God help me, amen. I don't know about you, but you might need to shout that out. You, I don't know how, I don't know where, but all I know is responding to Jesus is the only way of escape. God is fighting for me. God is fighting for me. Friend, I don't know, I can't say it. I'm not saying this for an altar call. The time is late, I wanna go home. <laughs> All I know, I want to see people set free. I don't want you to come into this church and go out still, but just come and let God touch you. If you need to come, come. If you want to help, help, come. He is fighting for you, glory to God. He is covering your sin. He is covering it. He's doing it for us. 
as we sing this song somehow or other you respond to God the way you need to respond I'm over finish oh, God is fighting for 